Bishena. Welcome, everyone. We're going to begin with the Lord's Prayer in the ancient Aramaic tongue. Shall we pray? Awun Nuashme Yanit Kadeshishmah Tethi Malkusach Nechwe Sivianach Ekanadashme Yapar Ah Haulan Lach Mesunkan and Yawana Washwoklam Haubain Ekanadap Hanan Shwakin Lahayawain La Talanisiona Ella Possen in Bisha Mithol Ilahi Malkutha Haila Tishbohta La Alam Almin Amen. Tonight, I'm going to do something about the term Abba or Awa, Father in Aramaic. Why did Jesus use the term Father so much? What was he accomplishing by doing and saying constantly, calling God Father? And this is very important. Okay. I know in the West, because I got letters all the time, when I wrote the book on the Lord's Prayer, which opens up with our Father, who is everywhere or throughout the universe, however you want to translate that. But it starts with our Father. And I used to get letters from people who, mostly women, who got angry with me because I constantly referred to God as Father. Well, you would have never liked Jesus then because he used the term Father all the time. He wasn't born in the West. He was born in the Near East. And you have to understand that special relationship that Jesus was after Instead of talking about a deity in the sky somewhere, he brought something fresh and he wanted it in a very practical way. And that's why he constantly, he constantly referred to God as father. Why? Because he was emphasizing a patriarch of the heavens. No, not at all. This is how we think in the West, but not in the Near East. Uh, aside from the fact that the term father and mother are terms of endearment in the Near Eastern world, even to this very day, when you want to show affection and closeness and fondness, you use the term father and mother with friends and, and anyone else you feel that you're close to. Those were terms of endearment. That's still not exactly what I'm after tonight. What I did is I just went through the Gospel of Matthew, and I thought, how many times did Jesus use the term Father? Not just when he was referring to it, when he was referring this term in regards to people. When, how many times did he say our father and your father singular, your father plural, when he was speaking to more than one person? So if you're going to say one person, your father, we say awoh. If I'm going to say your father plural, your father, every everyone, your father, and I'm speaking to more than one person, I say awuchon, awuchon, which makes it plural. So I just went through Matthew only, and I didn't do them all, but I came up with 25 verses of Jesus using that term when he was teaching, even when he was sending his disciples out. It's amazing how much he's, why, what? Was he after? And when we say the prayer and we open up with our 
Father, what is happening in us? What what was Jesus after? Okay, let's talk about the term God. Now, in the Jewish prayer system, they did use the term Father before even Jesus used it, but Jesus used it constantly, all the time. In other words, he didn't, just didn't use it liturgically as in the Jewish prayers, because God is referred to as King, God is referred to as the Almighty, God is referred to the Lord of Lords, God is referred to all these huge terms to express God. In fact, when people think of God, what they think of is power, where they think of something strange and powerful and so supernatural, he'll change the whole world magically like that. <laughs> and it doesn't work that way at all. You have to understand what Jesus was after. First of all, God is portrayed when he uses the term father, think of creator. Don't think just masculine. If you know what I'm saying here, of course, when we say father, we're going to th we think masculine. But this is why people are up against it, because they only think one way. They think just think masculine. But you have to realize when we talk about the fatherhood of God, we're talking about creation. I would say in Aramaic, Awa de Brita. Awa de Brita means father of creation. In other words, creator. With, you have to have father and mother. But what Jesus was after is the idea, and this is what it means in Genesis, the first chapter when he says, let us make humankind our image and our likeness. God was after a family. And this is what Jesus was doing with the term father. He was taking it out of the set religious system and putting it into an understanding of God as you would a family. <laughs> he took it right out of all of the pomp and ceremony and incense and sacrifices and all these different things. And he put God in the position of a family. He wanted this to get through to all of those who were listening to him, partaking of his teachings. He wanted us to understand God as father. Why? Why? Why family? So you would recognize you are his son or daughter. It was the reason we use the term father is we took God out of the temple, <laughs> out of the doctrines, out of the dogmas, out of the ceremonies, out of the processions, and put God right in your heart, mind, emotions, and spirit. When you say our father, you see, it's like water on a duck's back. <laughs> you pour water on a duck's back, it just flows right on out, right, right on through. <laughs> but when Jesus gave this and the constant emphasis, this is why the Gospel of John develops everything around that. Everything he teaches in the Gospel of John is based on the family relationship. Jesus' family relationship with God and our family relationship with God through Jesus' teachings. And But what we have to realize is that when we use the term Father, you've got to realize you are in a relationship a very wonderful, personal, real, dynamic, expressive relationship as a son and daughter of God. We don't feel that way. For instance, 
when you go to a church, you are a member of the church. And God is still up there somewhere. <laughs> or God is over here. Or God is, uh, even though we say, oh, God is everywhere. Yeah, well, that's good. But what makes it better is when I discover that I am a son of that God or a daughter of that God. So when you use the term father, it's, it's the emphasis isn't on masculinity. Oh, he's a patriarch. No. What you're saying here is that you are a part of the family of what we call God. <laughs> That's why God, the term father is used for God all the way through. And you see, during the time of Jesus, God was in the temple. And that's why in the Gospel of John, he made the temple our bodies when he referred to his own. He says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. He was talking about his body because he knew the real temple of God wasn't made of stone, wasn't made of anything you see physically in the sense of stone or wood or a shrine or something like that he made flesh and blood the very temple and sacredness and holiness of god that's where god dwells <laughs> so that means you can talk to god intimately you can talk just like you would to a father and i know i've also gotten letters saying i had a a bad father and all this and it's hard for me to relate got news for you my father wasn't too good either i could tell you things that make your hair stand on end and he wasn't a drunkard either but he did a lot of things and i don't want to talk about that now and i didn't have what i call a really good father but don't blame him for it don't blame him for it but i didn't associate because this fatherhood when we talk about the fatherhood of god we're talking about love talking about love now you remember when john appeared on the scene john the baptist now i'm not talking about john the one who wrote the gospel I'm talking about john the Baptist, when he appeared, he called people, that is the Pharisees and Sadducees that were coming to them, he called them scorpions. <laughs> scorpions is what he called them. And it's in Matthew, the third chapter. And he says, oh, offspring of scorpions, who has warned you to escape from the anger which is to come? That's how he saw the kingdom. <laughs> he, that's how he saw the kingdom. Jesus didn't see it that way at all. But he says, and don't you think and say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Of course, he's exaggerating, of course, but nonetheless, they were always claiming their forefather, Abraham. In other words, it's when we always declare just our nationality or just, for instance, I am of Italian descent, born here in America, but of Italian descent. But my grandmother and grandfather were born in Italy. My father, there's a big discrepancy over that, where he was, Italy or here. But nonetheless, Je Jesus is showing here, I mean, not Jesus, but he's showing here, John is, don't bank on your race on your blood, on your background. That's what John the Baptist is saying. 
And this is the reason why I brought out John first before I get more into Jesus is because I wanted to show you how we feel connected. We feel connected to our descent, what we are, regardless of what race it is, regardless of it's Near Eastern, Western, or what we are. And of course, America is a, is a mixture of all kinds. But nonetheless, we feel very attached to it. That's what I'm getting at. That's exactly what I'm getting at is that attachment to your descendancy, to your ancestors, to your what you what you have flowing in your veins, your blood. And we're so attached to that. Now, now you see why Jesus used God as father, because we are to have that same attachment that we have flowing in our veins, we're to have it flowing in our hearts and minds by spirit, God as our father. Do you get the intimacy I'm talking about here? I want you to get that because when people always talk about God, it's still way up there. <laughs> it's it, You don't feel that attachment just as you do to your race just as you do to your blood just as you do to your body and your descendancy uh -huh. and and you read the bible everything's built on that descendancy that's why john says not of blood not the will of a man not the will of a group but born of god in other words, the more we acknowledge the fatherhood of God, we acknowledge our descendancy and relationship of what and who we are. You see, we identify with doctrines, dogmas, churches, belief systems. That's why, you know, you go to all the churches and once a month or sometimes some churches do it every single Sunday, what we believe. And there's your list of what we believe. And you, you recite it and say it because you're identifying with your belief systems. But what we have missing is we don't identify with our sonship with our and, I'll, and when i say sonship i'm using it the way it's used in the bible which includes male and female daughters just like when we say fathers in aramaic the word for parents in aramaic is fathers <laughs> and that means mother in there see? they use awahe for parents awa, awa is father awahe is plural fathers so if you want to say parents in Aramaic, you have to say awahe, which means mother and father. So it is when they use the term sons, sons of God, which means sons and daughters. But we make such a distinction here in the West, sons and daughters. But, you know, you can quote Paul because it's always involved in male and female. But Paul says, in Christ, there is neither male nor female. We are, and we're using a human expression. And this is what Jesus was getting through to us when he was using this term, Father. Now, I, I like, let's go to 5, 6. We go to Jesus here. 5, 6. No, I don't want six. I thought I, I put it down right. No, it's 16. <laughs> no wonder. 516. Let your light so shine. Now, people are saying, well, what is my destiny in life? What should I do? In my Let your light shine. 
before people or men, as the way it's written in the scriptures, I like to always translate that as people, that they may that they may see your good works, manifestation. And as a result of that, glorify your Father <laughs> in heaven. Glorify. In other words, we do that today. When you see a child of such good behavior, of such good expression and 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 very well mannered and everything, what do we think of? What do we think of right away when we see a child like that? If come on, I'm I'm asking you something here. What do you think of right away? What wonderful parents that child has. You glorify the parents because you see something in that child and the way he expresses and and the manners he has and all that is because of the way he was brought up by the parents. And you automatically think right to the parents and you will automatically glorify the parents <laughs> the way it is. So that's what Jesus was saying. Here. What is your destiny? What did you the more you let your light shine, because that light is the light of God. It's the light of God, the light of truth, the light of joy, the light of peace, the light of understanding. You don't go by what you see physically. You see from a different level and you do these good manifestations. And it, we think of the word works here because that's what was used because it means acts, good acts that you do. I like that better than works. Good acts. And you, A-C-T-S. And that, they will glorify your Father in heaven. Hmm? There's more. Let's go to the end of the fifth chapter. And... The 45th verse. Well, you know, if you read 44, he's saying, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless anyone who curses you, do good to anyone who hates you, and pray for those who carry you away by force and persecute you. So that, okay, so that, what? What? Why should I love my enemy? Bless those who are those who are putting curses on me and I turn around and put blessings on them. Or hates you. Do good to those who hate you. Why? So that you may be or become. Either way is correct. So that you may be or become sons of of your father sons of your father you see the connection of the term father when we pray the term when we use the term father it's 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 just a term we don't get the sense of being a true child daughter son of god it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it just stays father there, up there, but not your connection with it. And that's what I'm after tonight. And this is why Jesus used the term father so much. He wanted to keep everything as a family, that family relationship. And how are you joined in a family relationship? By love, by love. And regardless of what goes on, Hmm? All humanity belongs to God. In fact, when God has sons, he says, you are mine. <laughs> you are mine. And you answer and reply, yes, I am yours. I 
am yours. I come from you. You are my creator. Not just the physical. We're not talking about the physical. We're talking about the spirit that is in you. That spiritual essence of your being. If we were only taught this when we were children. But God is in the sky somewhere. God is in the and then you have to go. I was brought up Roman Catholic. And in order to get, no one hardly got to God. You always had to go through someone else. Either say, I had to go through St. Rocco because my name was Rocco. Or my grandmother all the time prayed to San Andon, which was St. Anthony. And, and <clears throat> all these intermediaries between you and Father. You and Father. Jesus is the Hediah, the firstborn son who sees after all the sons of God. He was that firstborn boy which sees after everyone. That's why his teachings are so powerful. Okay, so you love your enemies through the, and all these things he always says, connect it so that you may be sons of of your father who is in heaven. And then that means also I could say who is in secret or who is hidden that you can't physically see, but you feel, you know, you feel. See, we always think of heaven. It's just way up in the sky. And besides the word heaven there means heavens. It's plural. It's really plural. Meaning everywhere. All right. Who causes his sun to shine upon the good and the bad? Don't you see? When you love your enemy, bless anyone who curses you, do good to those who hate you, you're like the sun. You're like God, the father. Because the father, what? Who causes it? He says, Sons of your father who is in heaven, who, this is what your father does, causes his son to shine upon the good and the bad. You see, keep this all connected. It has to all be connected. Who shines upon who, the sun, upon the good and the bad. And, and you can also translate that word as wicked, which in Luke it is. It's translated as wicked. And who pours down his rain upon the just and the unjust. This is so different from the book of Job because they were always after Job. You've done something in your life <laughs> and therefore this is why you are suffering, Job. And I don't want to teach the book of Job, but this is it. The Jesus is, he has transcended it all. He's transcended everything. He's putting God in the very heart and center of all humanity as father. This is why he uses the word father and not God. It's not what is your God. What is your father like? How are you being parented? Hmm? So he says, for if you love only those who love you, what reward will you have? Then he goes on to that. But let's go to the 48th verse. Therefore, become mature. That word, gimera, gimera, pardon me, gimera. Lambda translated is perfect, which it does mean that too. But it means mature, mature, a mature son. Keep it all, 44 and 48 all, from 44 all to 48 all is one thought of your father. Therefore, become mature or all-inclusive, just, just like your father, just as your father in heaven is all-inclusive. You see, this is why he uses the term father. Because that is we have more than a God. We have a father, a spiritual father. 
And what is that nature of that father? Well, that was clear in verses 44, 46, or, or from 44 all the way down to 48 in chapter 5 of Matthew. And this is Jesus talking there. You know, we have the, the three chapters there, 5, 6, and 7, which we call the Sermon on the Mount. But man, this was no sermon. This was a heart-to-heart realization of what it is to be or become a son and daughter of God by calling him father. I, I wrote down all the scriptures here on, on, on the page here. Let's go to six, I would, I think six, six, six. See what it says here. But as for you, he's talking about prayer. But as for you, when you pray, enter into your inner chamber and lock your door and pray to your father who is in uh, this word secret has many meanings in Aramaic. Secret's a good term. Nothing wrong with the term secret but it's 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 also for the use this very same word i'm going to spell it for you it's k s y a k s y a if i was spelling it for you in aramaic it would be cap simcat yod alep cap simcat yod alep that's K S Y A Kissya Kissya and Kissya it falls on the first syllable Kissya Kissya which means something mystical a mystic a mystic that's why the word secret is used mystery mystic you can't see it but you feel it. So you, when you pray, <laughs> you know, when people say you pray, well, who, who are you talking to? You, but that's what makes it mystical because it is hidden. That's, that's, that word also means hidden. <laughs> it means covered. Covered, hidden, secret. So, it says, so when you pray to your father who is hidden, who is hidden, and your father who sees in hidden what is what you're doing privately, quietly, all to yourself. This is the inner chamber right here. Your own mind, your own heart. Mind and heart are inseparable. They are inseparable. That's why the Bible uses the term libba. Jesus used it and the apostles use it. They use the term libba, which means heart, means mind, because mind and heart are inseparable. We have divided it. We made mind stuck up here and the heart here because we're thinking of the organs. We're thinking of the heart. We're thinking of the brain. But when libba is used heart, it means also mind. Heart and mind are inseparable. If you're thinking of the organ, it doesn't work. But we know that the brain, of course, covers everything all over inside the body. But quit thinking materially and physically and think spiritually. Mind heart are interchangeable when i say heart i mean mind especially in aramaic libba when when jesus used it in his beatitude when he said those who are pure in heart i'm not talking about this humping organ he's talking about the mind the clear mind mind that has been washed clear 
clear mind. Pure mind is a clear mind. <laughs> See, so that God can be expressed through it. Expressed through your whole being. So when I say mind or I say heart, they're one and the same to me. That's how I understand it. And that's because of, of the Aramaic usage. So you pray in a hidden way. And when you pray, who's there? Who are you talking to? But you know, if you're talking to Father, you can talk just like you talk to anyone else. You know, we have liturgical prayers, you know, that churches put out. This is here. You, you say this, you say this, keep saying this, keep saying this, keep saying this, instead of just talking. You know, when I first started out in prayer, when I was only 16, I talked to God just like I would talk to anyone else. Because I didn't realize the use of the term father then. But I talked to him just like anyone else. And I desired with all my heart when I was just 16 to understand this book we call the Bible. It's a library of books is what it is. And I wanted to understand it because I wanted to understand what it had for me to grip and understand how I can become intimate with it. So calling God Father is a term not only of endearment, but of intimacy. He's your parent. He's your love parent. He's your guide. And he talks to you. When, I, when I'm teaching on the Gospel of John, which will be in September, I'm going to go into the inner life of Jesus to show you how intimate he was with God. That's why God flowed through him so beautifully. And that's why Jesus constantly talked about God as Father throughout the Gospel of John. And, oh, there's, I, I know how I would love to get into that tonight, but I'm not going to do that. Because there's so much there. Just so much. Okay. But now what I'm going to get to is your daughtership and sonship with God. Hmm? That's what I want to get at. This is when you're using this term, Father, that's what I want you to get. I want you to get the feeling of it. Once you get the feeling of it and you relax with it and know that you're dealing with Father and not a God. But a fatherly love, a caring love, a healing love, a guiding love, father, a creative love. It stimulates the creativeness in you. It stimulates the love in you. It stimulates and brings alive and awakens your being. All you have to do is, you know, oh, what's the special secret to doing it? Well, I have two emails that were sent in asking me almost these very questions. And, and I'll probably answer that for them. But what I'm going to get here is how Jesus used it. Why he used the term father so much. Only once in a while he used the term God. But Father was the basic way he expressed it. And if you're going to read the Gospel of John, that's you're going to get that all the way through the Gospel of John. And all I did was just Matthew. I didn't do it in Mark. I didn't do it in Luke. And I just came up with 25 verses. So let's go to, let's see, verse, what does 18 say here? Mm -hmm. He's talking about fasting. Again, he used the same thing that he did in prayer. He said, when you're fasting, don't appear as if you're fasting. So that it may not appear to people that you are fasting. But to your father, who is hidden, that is in secret, or who is hidden, and your father who sees what is hidden will 
reward you. In other words, you will feel that connection with God. I'll never forget that time. Some of you have heard me say this, and I'm, I guess I'm going to say it again. <laughs> I never get tired because it was so amazing to me what happened to me. There was a, I was in my early days of ministry. I was in my 20s, about 24, 25. And I was with a lot of uh, older ministers in their 30s and 40s. And some of them, because I always had an insight of some kind, and I can't explain it, that I always spoke. And there was one minister that just all the time badgered me constantly, constantly, all the time. And it just drove me crazy. And finally, I told the other minister that I was working with, I said, I'm not going to that meetings of ministers anymore. I'm tired of being poked and bad things said to me. And he said, okay, do what you want. But, you know, it bothered me that I was beginning to build resentment towards this other minister. It was really bothering me. And I was down in Mexico doing uh, work in Mexico. We, we owned a, a full block down there in Mexico in um, Linares. And... I, it was hard for me to minister stuff because I could feel this resentment so deep in my being in my twenty. And I was here was I was a minister. And what, 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 how can I get get this out of my system? I couldn't do it. Finally, I had to speak that night. So before I spoke, got down on my knees, and I started to pray. And you know how I, you know what my prayer is? <laughs> you know what I said? I said, Father, you know, here I am in prayer with you. And I said, you know, I have resentment and hatred in my heart. It was strong in me. I said, you know, I have hatred and, and this resentment in my heart so strong. I can't hide that from you. And yet I got to go speak tonight and speak about spiritual things when I'm carrying this resentment in me and I can't handle it. And the moment I said, I can't handle it. In other words, it was at home in me and having a good time. <laughs> and as soon as I said that, I was inundated, flooded with love, with peace, with, it shocked me. It shocked me. The resentment just went away. And instead of God saying, you're such a bad boy. Do you, are you, do you really want to get rid of it? N none of that at all. I just talk just like I'm talking to you right now. Exactly those were my words. I, I'm resenting him and I'm, it's sticking in me. Just like that. And God flooded me. Father, now, Father flooded me. That was new. It was only early in my ministry. And flooded me with such love. I could hardly wait to get to see that minister to see what would happen. I'll never forget it. I spoke that night. It was powerful in because I spoke in Spanish as well uh, as in English. And if I ran into trouble, I had someone there who, who could help me with the Spanish words. But after that, I went to Reading, Pennsylvania, and that, all the ministers meeting were, were uh, meeting there in Reading, Pennsylvania. We got snowed in, and we got all stuck together in the one room. <laughs> and uh, we had separate bedrooms, of course, but I was stuck with this minister who constantly, and sure enough, as soon as I met him, jab, slice, it, it was so petty and so... 
ridiculous. But you know what I did then? So everyone put their shoes out, out of the bedroom on the side there. I took his shoes and I polished them. And in the morning when he got up and saw his shoes were polished, he says, who did this? I never said a word. No one said a word who did it, but I did it. And then he had a feeling. He looked at me and says, did you do something to this? I said, well, they look pretty bad. I think it needed shining. And then he hugged me. And as he hugged me, he whispered barbs in my ear, cutting me again, just like he always did. He could just never do it straight. He cut again. And it was like water off a duck's back. He couldn't do anything. He could even spit on me or do anything he wanted. It didn't make any difference now because a change had occurred. Something I couldn't do because I wanted to harbor that hate. I wanted to live in that hate and I wanted to get even. A minister? How could you? Easily. <laughs> Very easily because I'm also a human being. So it got taken care of. And I didn't even, and I just, all I was doing was just being honest with God. And God ignored me. It just filled me with love and it all disappeared. Hmm? When it says love your enemies, if you can't love your enemies, God will, because you're his son. <laughs> you're his son. You're his daughter. He'll give you that peace that you need. Even if you're not asking for it. But if you're open with God and sincere with God and you don't try to hide. There was, there was no secret. I said, hey, you know I've got this ugly thing in me. So that's it. And how can I pray with this ugly thing in me? That's what it means. God is Abba, or Abba, Father, Father. It, 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 what does it have to do with male or female? It's just that fatherhood, that creativeness, that creativeness of Father. Mm -hmm. And for us to acknowledge our relationship, that's why we use it. Oh, you know, I had a whole bunch of verses here, all of them here, that I wanted to go over, but I think that's enough. And I wanted to show you the practicality of it before we get to our questions. Now, I have two questions here I've got to get to. I don't know if there are any. Yeah, there's two here. Let me see if there, if it's too involved, because I promised these two I would get to him. Uh, Dr. Erico, someone asked me a question that I couldn't answer. So the question is, how do we know or how do we know that we have the correct Aramaic translation coming from the cuneiform or, or not, uh, or from another ancient manuscript? Thanks. No. Oh, I see. Yes. Well, I have these manuscripts. I have them up there and they're dated and all that. And it's from the fifth century. Like we have the 5th century, we have the 6th century, and and you know what? People are so concerned about that. The Hebrew Masoretic text is 10th century A.D. <laughs> These are even older than the Masoretic Hebrew text that all scholars used to do translation from. So, and we have Dr. Lamza, I would tell him, Dr. Lamza is an Aramaic-speaking person. That was his native tongue. He didn't learn it from a book. When I learned Aramaic, I had to learn it from a book. It's not my native tongue. But being with him, I got to learn how all the fine nuances of a word that even sometimes the dictionary doesn't bring out. It'll bring out several meanings of a word, but it doesn't give you that nice nuance that you know from the culture and background. Hmm? You tell them, this person is asking, well, it's been investigated. It's been, you don't expect to all of a sudden magically get it. Of course, it's years and years of study that I've done in this, okay? All right. 
Hello, Robbie. My question is the Hebrew word psalm, which means fasting or fast. Is there a deeper understanding than just not eating food? Yes, you fast from your own thoughts. You fast from your, and that's what physical fasting does. It shuts you down, shuts you up. <laughs> so when you, because you get weak physically and you can't think too well, that's what's it. It's that you starve <laughs> yourself from thinking and letting go. Fasting weakens you where you flow with it. So yes, you fast from your ways of thinking. You fast from all of that. I do that kind of fasting all the time. All right. Hello, Dr. Rocco. Did Jesus mean to say that we all share the same essence and that essence is God? Yes, we're all in that. Same. Because this essence is universal, but it particularizes as you and me and other people. Okay. All right. Now, let me get to these two here. Let me put this down. All right. Oh, no, this isn't it here. These over here. All right. I know that Dr. Erico says that modern day interpretation of Satan, hell, and the war in heaven is a mistranslation or misunderstanding of the language and culture of the time. I heard online that Paul presented his version of Jesus teaching to James and the elders of the time and they authorized them. If it's true, is there such a wide divergence between Jesus and the current apocalyptic second coming rapture doctrines of the current Pauline churches? Also, if mine is to know, if mine is to know the Father and Jesus and their path for me, will that help? Yes, definitely. Is there a better way through the narrow gate? <laughs> no, that is the only way through the teachings of Jesus. Okay, but you know, so the Allah, uh, no, this one, I. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Let me go to this one. Hello again. More questions for growth personally. What I talked on tonight was definitely for more growth personally. I understand we are spiritual beings operating in human form. I want to to know how, as I look and see more and more information out there being spread around and investigated and experimented with by a growing number, even across the world, how to connect it with the teachings of the Christ in spirit and truth. I don't want to get sidetracked by other teachings but to have my intentions be that of God to know fully or more fully what I am and who I am in God. What did I do tonight? You see, you seem to steer away from what many call the supernatural. Mm. But God is that. No, God is, we call God supernatural, but I, you know what I always tell them? I'm going to show you just how super the natural is. <laughs> because naturally we have this given to us by God. That's how I, that's how I define supernatural. <laughs> just how super the natural is. Because we try to make ourselves get something else when we have it already in us, okay? Part of us. It says, um, so I don't steer away from the super. I steer away from the woo-woo stuff. <laughs> not, not the real, genuine. That's why I use the word spirituality, okay? 
Huh. So we are being made in the image and likeness of God. We are in the image and likeness of God. The day we were born, but spiritually we have to mature according to what is written and also living in the world simultaneously. Yes, we are flesh and we are spirit. Jesus was doing the same thing. He was living in the flesh, but living spiritually at the same time, both at the same time. I know I know it all has to do with the mind, and you have it in caps, which is true. I already explained about mind and heart. I am so grounded, but I want to and need to get my feet off the ground and into the spiritual world and life. Thank you for any response. Okay, well, what I did tonight was a response. There was another one. I don't know where I put it. I must have laid it down somewhere else. Let me take a look. There was one more. Uh, no, that's not it. Where they asked me about, and I don't know where I put it. I don't know. I must have laid it down somewhere else unless it's still up here. No. The other question, I remember the question because I had read it. Okay, the question was that they are learning from Silva Mind Control, but a new, but a new addition to it. Jose Silva, he did Silva Mind Control. This was in the 60s. When he was spreading that, he was he, he had his headquarters in Laredo, Laredo, Texas. And he came up to San Antonio in the 60s when I was pastoring. And I met Jose Silva and even went down to Laredo and talked with him. And I gave Jose Silva, I gave him all the commentaries of Lambs. These weren't in existence yet, where I enlarged it more and where Dr. Lambs and I did work together. He only had three commentaries. And it was Old Testament light, gospel light, and more light on the gospel, just three. And, and I gave him the Bible and the three commentaries. And we talked for a long time. He was very, very interested in Dr. Lamza and the Aramaic translation of the Bible. Very interested in it. And uh, the courses he did was the developing of the four different energies in the brain that come through the brain and you know it was the right now we're in the beta but lots of times when i'm talking to you i'm in theta and in alpha i go to there's four four beta is when you're really working hard and doing all the thing all that beta energy is going when you're driving a car and all that Sometimes you slip into alpha too when you're driving a car, but it's beta, alpha, theta, delta. Delta is deep, deep sleep and also death, but toward death. So you have those four energies. So what the question was, I don't know where I put that letter. No, that's not it. But having they asked me about that they are now taking a new course that they're using in the silver method. Jose Silver is no longer with us physically, but a new one where they just teach you using alpha waves from the brain. But it's the it's, it's you can get alpha and data and and data waves just through meditation. However, they're going to use a system to help you get there there in faster. And this is what the person asked me. Uh, uh, but to me, to me, the theta waves are stronger than the alpha waves. They're important, absolutely, the alpha waves. But the theta is really, that's when you really open up and see things at the theta level. And when you, all you have to do is close your eyes and begin to, the more you relax, you see, most of the time when people meditate, they're pushing themselves. 
shoving themselves into it. And it just doesn't work. The moment you tighten up, when you tighten up like that, you will not, you'll get beta waves going and not alpha and theta. You don't want delta because you'll go to sleep. But the two, alpha and theta, but the theta is the most important. That's 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 when you're reading the Bible and they slipped into the seeing these visions or dreams, they're in the theta level. They're more than the alpha, they're in the theta level. So the the, the question was, is it all right? Yes, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that, the alpha. But the real secret is getting into that theta level. And that comes also with relaxing, letting go, and allowing it to come through with the brain waves. But that's the spiritual, that's the spirit energy coming through there. We're using the brain waves coming in. Okay. All right. Those are all the questions. Now I would uh oh, did I get two more? But I am gonna have to stop right now. Yeah, I'll have to do that not, not in the following week, because this coming Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, not, you know, this coming up next week, Reverend Hanny Freewatt will have the class next Wednesday evening. All right. So I will get um, the Jesus preach pantheism. No, he did not. I just happened to see that question here. I already answered one of them. There's two more and I'll get to them next session that we do together all right bless you everyone love you